U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Good afternoon, and welcome to our 12th INS lecture for this academic year. I'm John Jackson, and I will serve as host for today's event. Rear Admiral Chatfield is on travel and can't join us today, but I'm pleased to welcome you on her behalf. We've enjoyed bringing you this series as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. It has been expanded to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, including members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the nation. Looking ahead, I invite you to join us on April 5th, when I will have the opportunity to speak about robots that fly, swim, and crawl. Some folks around here call me the Duke of Drones, and we will take a quick look at the number of robotic and unmanned systems being used both in the military and in civilian applications. Okay, on with the main event. During the presentation that follows, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. The topic of war is very much in the news in recent weeks, and warfare has been part of human existence for thousands of years. The aim of our discussions this afternoon is to explore how philosophers and other scholars, thinkers, have thought about the moral dimensions of political violence and our responsibilities and obligations as human beings. Our speaker will discuss some historical examples of just and unjust wars and will reference current events. Professor Pauline shanks Corin holds a PhD in philosophy from Temple University, specializing in military ethics, just war theory, and applied ethics. She also holds a BA in philosophy and international relations from Concordia College and an MA in philosophy from the University of Manitoba. She currently serves as the Stockdale Chair and Professor of Professional Military Ethics here in Newport on the faculty of the College of Leadership and Ethics. She is a globally recognized expert in the field and has authored numerous books, including On Obedience, Contrasting Philosophies for Military, Citizenry, and Community, published by the U.S. Naval Institute Press in 2020. She was featured contributor for the Strategy Bridge and has published in Clear Defense, The Waverell Room, Newsweek, War on the Rocks, Grounded Curiosity, U.S. Naval Institute Proceedings, Just Security, and a welfare of other academic journals. I know of no other scholar better qualified to discuss the issues of just war. Pauline, the podium is yours. Hello, can you all hear me? Are we on? There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you, John, for that lovely welcome. And thank you all, uh, those of you who are in person and out there in Zoom land, for coming to join us um, to talk about uh, what I call just war thinking, which is uh, some people refer to it as just war theory. Uh, some people refer, refer to it as the just war tradition. I use just war thinking because it's not one theory and it's not one uh, tradition. Um, and so what we want to do today is just give you an overview about how philosophers and other scholars have looked at these questions. But I also want to root what we're about to do um, in a little humility and a little sensitivity to what is going on uh, in the world, what is always going on in the world. But uh, our television sets and, and our screens have been inundated with the pictures of the reality including the moral reality of war. And so I want to be um, sensitive to that. Um, and that's part of what got me into this area of study in the first place, right? This is something that I've thought about 
and taught about um, for over 25 years. And so it's something I take very seriously. And I think like all of you, those pictures uh, that we are seeing on the TV are just heartrending, right? So this is part of my response um, as, as an academic, as a professor, to think about these kinds of questions. Okay, so uh, here you see a, a, a rendition of Picasso's famous uh, painting, Guernica. Uh, which uh, depicts uh, non-combatant civilian suffering and harm. You'll also notice there's animals in there, which is one reason that I like this. If you come to my office, I have a, a, a poster of this in my office and have had since I started uh, teaching a long time ago. So in just war thinking, and I'm talking predominantly today about what we might term the Western perspective on this. Virtually any society that has warriors, that has military, that engages in warfare has some kind of discourse about when war is morally justified uh, and how one may act in war. So you're only getting a small slice today. Um, so the core question here is under what conditions is war morally permissible or justified? So the argument here is not that war is just in an intrinsic sense, that it's an intrinsically good thing that one ought to do. That's not the argument. Um, there have been a few people who have made that argument, but that is not this argument. The question is, under what conditions would we say it is morally permissible or justified? We're saying we are going to allow you to do it meaning that you are not doing something immoral if you engage in warfare. So um, the flip side of that is that if war is not morally justified, it's murder, right? So this question is a very, very serious one, right? Under what conditions is war morally justified or permissible? Okay, so let's see if I can get this to work. Ooh. Uh, so in thinking about current events, this is some fog on a pathway. Um, I think when we're looking at current events, we're uh, literally and figuratively in the fog of war. So whatever comments I make about current events are provisional, and I'll probably change my mind tomorrow as more evidence comes in. But this is also true about historical events, right? So I will talk about a few historical events. I'm not a historian. I don't play one on TV. Uh, I'm a philosopher. Uh, but history uh, and current events can be helpful to illustrate some of my points. Okay, so there are three uh, grand narratives about how one might respond to war. The first is pacifism, which is the view that uh, resort to violence uh, in war or otherwise is never morally justified. Uh, second, just war thinking, which is the one we're going to talk about today. And third is uh, different versions of realism, um, which depending on the version, generally uh, focus on that we should consider war from the standpoint of state interest, right? And that perhaps moral categories are either not helpful, irrelevant, or superfluous in thinking about war. So my illustration of that is if you have seen Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, you're familiar with Jack Sparrow, who's the main character, uh, Johnny Depp's character. And at one point, he's having a conversation with another uh, would-be pirate. And he, he says to this young man, he says, you have to decide what you can do and what you can't do. Right? And, and Jack Sparrow's character says, I can't bring this ship in to port without help. Right? And so he's using this to say, this is not about what's right or what's wrong. This is about what's possible, what I can do, and what I can't do, and those uh, limitations. I actually think this is a really good illustration of realism, but my political science colleagues may disagree with me, so I await the rebuttal. Uh, Michael Walzer wrote a book called Just and Unjust Wars in 1977 in the aftermath of Vietnam, and he's generally recognized as the dean of just war thinking in the 20th century. Um, and he wants to know, he starts his first chapter by rebutting realism. Um, and his question is, what's the, 
moral world or, or experience that war creates. So for Walzer, it creates a new moral world, which requires new moral categories. And also, we experience that whether we are involved as combatants or non-combatants as a moral activity, right? So strategy, like morality, is a language of justification, of giving reasons. Uh, and then the second quote is, but the truth is that one of the things most of us want, even in war, is to act or to seem to act morally. And we want that most simply because we know what morality means. So Walzer thinks that there's a moral reality to war and that that's how we experience war, right? And his book has predicated on that. Okay, so we're gonna do a, a little meta moment here. I'm not referring to our friends at what used to be Facebook, but what is just war thinking good for? Um, so there's different views of this. First is one view might be that it's a deliberative discourse, that it helps us talk about our deliberation process. When we're thinking about war, it helps us deliberate. Another argument is that it's a decision-making model, much like our aviator's checklist that you go through to decide uh, if you are ready, particularly to resort to force. Another view popularized by my colleague in Britain, Dr. David Wetham, is that it's an account of exceptions. Um, so there are certain times uh, even though in our society there's a presumption against violence, there are certain times when we say violence is permissible, perhaps used by police force, perhaps in the case of capital punishment, and here in the case of war, right? So normally we say you can't engage in violence, but we also give an account of under what conditions we will make exceptions to that rule, right? Uh, another... Uh, view is that especially after a war, just war thinking helps to tell us what we should be morally shocked at and then perhaps what we ought to ask for accountability for or punishment for. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you which of these is correct uh, because there's a lot of debate in the literature about which of these um, makes most sense. If you want to talk about in the Q&A, we can certainly talk about that, but here's, some, so those are some different views. What I will say is that just war thinking is a kind of discourse that is concerned with the question of when is war murder and when is it not murder, right? And that's a very, very serious um, theological and philosophical question. Uh, secondly, the intent of just war thinking is to limit the scope and number of wars that one fights. The idea is that this is going to sanction fewer wars than would be sanctioned otherwise, right? So it's to limit the number and scope of the wars that we do fight. Generally, just war thinking uh, seeks to prevent a greater moral harm. So the reason we can resort to violence is to prevent some other greater moral harm, let's say genocide from occurring, right? So this is a balance of different kinds of harms. Uh, it's also, I do think, a common language for engagement and discussion with others, right? So it gives us, uh, moral language is often a common language. Uh, it gives us concepts that we can engage with others. Um, and so we'll see that as we, as we go through here. And then last one, and this is really important for what we do at the Naval War College, um, ethical leadership is not just about your own moral perspectives, but it's about being able to articulate, justify, and have conversations with other people, um, and also to articulate your vision uh, of ethics to the people, especially that you lead. Just war thinking is a mode of ethical reflection and articulation. It asks us to think about when war is justified and to be able to give reasons and justify that to others. So this is what I take to be the point of the discourse, although there's a lot of debate about that. Okay, so there's some conceptual divisions within just war thinking. The first three are uh, traditional ones, use ad bellum, which is the resort to force, justice of the war itself, Use in bello, uh, the rules within which you may fight. In other words, how you ought to behave in war. Uh, 
use postbellum is the justice of after the war. So if we are in JMO, we might think of that as war termination questions, right? These are historically three important categories. In about 2006, Michael Walzer, who mentioned, was mentioned before, coined the term use ad vim to refer to the justice of actions that fell below the threshold of what we think of as war, which could include drone strikes, cyber activities, information warfare, things like that. And then use antebellum is the justice of preparation or training or education for war, which is a category I won't talk a lot about, but this is something that is of interest as part of what we do at the War College, right? How do you prepare people in the military um, and other places to fight wars? Okay, so we're gonna do a little historical track, not too much. Um, we usually start around here, although there's just war ideas in e Egyptian, Sumerian, Greek, and Roman thought, but we're gonna start with Augustine, who's one of the church fathers. Um, who's asking the question as Rome is um, disintegrating uh, and the church is rising as a political power, not just a theological power, um, can members of the church wage war? Can they participate in war, right? And this is a very serious theological question. And so he, he formulates the beginning of what we think of as, as this tradition. And the first question that he asks is, what is the end, the telos? the purpose of war, the aim of war, and his argument is it's to restore the peace. Which might seem counterintuitive that you're fighting war to restore peace, but he understands peace as justice. So something has happened to break justice. So there's been some kind of violation of justice. The aim of the war is to restore the peace. Uh, one has to have proper authority. We can't have anyone waging war. And in Augustine's day, lots of people were waging war. There were all kinds of private armies. The popes had their armies, various bishops, and uh, private individuals had their armies. And so he wants to say that you have to have a legitimate authority, which generally means either being the pope or uh, some other kind of political ruler. He argues you need to have just cause. Uh, which had to do with justice, so to restore some rights, to protect the innocent, to defend your allies was typically a just cause. And then in Augustine's day, to spread the gospel was a just cause. That one will fall out over time. And then the last piece is that you have to have just intentions. Augustine's the, the father of the doctrine of original sin, uh, he thinks that human beings are fallen and flawed. And so it's not enough to have a just cause or proper authority. You have to have just intentions in engaging in the war and you have to fight with just intentions. And so this is the beginning of some use in bellow requirements about how to treat your enemy. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, after Augustine in the medieval period, we, we, we start to get some some conversations about who can fight. So this is a use in bellow piece, right? Who's allowed to fight and who can be targeted. In the medieval period, uh, the institution of chivalry is really important. And so a lot of this is, is rooted in honor and class issues, but we have early use in bellow restrictions about who can fight and who can be targeted. Typically women, children, uh, elderly males and the infirm are excluded from being targeted and also excluded from fighting. Um, <clears throat> around the millennium, we have the truth of God and peace of God movements, um, which take up the issue of what should the role of the church be in waging war? So it was fairly common practice uh, early in the medieval period for members of the church, for clergy to be combatants, to be engaging in war. Um, but one of the things that happens is then churches and monasteries are getting looted and their clergy are being attacked. Um, and so eventually we evolved this idea that, well, that members of the church, especially clergy should not be participants in war and they should have a protected status as should churches. And if you've read um, my favorite Shakespeare play, Henry V, you know that um, Henry executes uh, several of his soldiers for pillaging a church, 
right? So after this, that, that will be considered a war crime. <clears throat> the question about who the rules apply to is a bit complicated because during this time period, both in church law and chivalry, uh, the idea was that this applied to other members of your class or other Christians. It did not apply if you were fighting in conflicts against non-Christians, um, which will change eventually. Uh, the other end of the medieval period, we have another church father, St. Thomas Aquinas, who basically says, yeah, what Augustine said, that sounds good. Um, except that he argues that the Crusades don't count, can't count as a just cause. So that starts to fall out. Um, and then he's also known for the doctrine of double effect, uh, which raises the question, are you responsible for those things that happen as a foreseeable side effect of what you do or only for those things that you intend, right? So you are targeting a munitions dump. It's next door to a high school or some residential school where there are children. Um, and you can foresee that children will probably be harmed. Are you responsible, morally responsible uh, for those deaths or that harm or only for uh, what you intend, which is blowing up the munitions dump, right? Augustine or Aquinas says you're responsible for those things you, you intend, not for the foreseeable uh, side effects, provided that you fulfill four criteria, which I won't go into here. We can talk about that. But basically, you have to, it, it can't be an, a, a bad end in itself, and you have to take provisions to mitigate the harm, right? And a, a lot of our discussions about collateral damage assessments and how we make those judgments are descended from this discussion. <clears throat> okay, in the modern period, so 15th, 16th century, up to this point, philosophy and theology have sort of been intertwined uh, with the, uh, the Reformation and the Enlightenment. They come to be pulled apart, and we start to see just war thinking split into a religious tradition um, or religious traditions and now secular traditions. And these four gentlemen here represent some figures from the uh, the modern secular tradition. So Grotius, <clears throat> the father of international law, Suarez, who started to argue that just war principles should apply to native peoples, um, especially as Spain and Portugal are engaging in conflicts with native peoples, indigenous peoples in, in, uh, in North and South America. And that does not make Suarez a popular dude. Uh, Vittoria, who... Uh, Ask the question, should you be disobedient to your political authority if you think the war you're being asked to fight is unjust? And also articulates what we now call the moral equality of combatants, which is the idea that combatants on a variety of sides fight for their governments in good faith <clears throat> and on the battlefield are to be considered moral equals in the sense that they're e they're equally liable to be targeted and entitled to equal POW protections and things like that. The moral equality of combatants in the, in the late 20th century, early 21st century comes under a lot of fire from a group of people called the revisionists, right? So um, that, that one becomes controversial. And then Vittel, who's interested in preventative and civil war, right? So these are sort of this little sampling of what's going on in the modern period. Okay, so just briefly, um, and we are going fast. Um, you said, Bellum, the resort to force. Here are the criteria. There are some people who argue that just intention should still be a criteria, and other people who, who say that just intention has been sorted out in other ways. But just cause, uh, proper authority, Proportionality of ends, which is the good to be achieved, has to outweigh the carnage you have to inflict in order to achieve that end. Last resort, you have to do other stuff first. Reasonable chance of success, it can't be a suicide mission. You have to have some reasonable sense that you can succeed. And then public declaration, because war is a public act. And for some people, public declaration also means you have to put people on notice 
with why you're going to war, right? So these are the typical uh, criteria. Proper authority has been uncontroversial really until the 1990s when there's a discussion about whether or not states in wars that are not wars of self-defense have the right to decide to go to war, right? And then, of course, uh, just cause typically is defensive, right? Typically has to be defensive or defensive allies. Um, but in the 20th century, scholars raised the question about whether genocide or ethnic cleansing, humanitarian interventions to stop those could count as a just cause. Lots of controversy about that. So these are the resort to force issues. So you could take your favorite conflict, including the one that, that we're talking about um, in, our, in our classes and in the coffee shops, and run it through and think about each of these criteria and ask yourself, do we think that Vladimir Putin has uh, fulfilled these criteria? Do we think that uh, George W. Bush in launching the 2003 Iraq intervention fulfilled these or not, right? One question is how many of them, my undergraduates always ask, how many of them do you have to have? And are they in any kind of rank order? They are in rank order, just cause is considered the most important. But there's a debate about how many of them you have to have. Do you have to have all of them? Okay, so that's use and bellum. Use and bellow is the conduct within the war. There's generally two major principles, uh, proportionality of means. So you have to use proportional force. You cannot use any weapons or tactics uh, that inflict suffering that is unnecessary to achieve the military end. Because just war thinking justifies only that force necessary to achieve the military objective. Any force above and beyond that is unnecessary suffering and will also inhibit the restoration of the peace at the end of the conflict. So proportionality of means rules out certain kinds of weapons, typically, uh, biological, uh, chemical, and nuclear, but other kinds of things have been, have been ruled out as well. The second principle is principle of discrimination. In uh, legal theory, this is called the principle of distinction. Um, and this is the idea that you have to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. And you notice I use those terms and not military and civilian, because not all members of the military are combatants, not all civilians are non-combatants. Um, but you have to discriminate between the two and you are entitled only to, to, to target uh, combatants and non-combatants are immune from being targeted, not just immune from being killed, they're immune from being targeted or being treated, as Michael Walzer says, as an object of war. So if you target non-combatants with non-lethal weapons, that is still a violation of the principle of discrimination. Okay, and then here is this idea of the moral equality of soldiers that the combatants on both sides are considered moral equals in the sense that they can be targeted and they are entitled to certain basic treatment. Uh, these two principles become the moral logic for the development of the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law um, in, in really in the 20th century right? Although the Lieber code is in the 19th century, right? But these are the two principles. Use ad vim, which I mentioned is a more recent sort of innovation since 2006, has two principles. Um, and, and use ad vim could include kinetic and non-kinetic actions, but anything below the threshold of what we would think of as, as conventional or, or war at all. Uh, the first criteria is last resort. And then the second criteria is risk of escalation, right? And so there's a question in the literature about shouldn't the use ad vim criteria be more permissive? Because you're not actually resorting to war. We still need some limitations, but this, this should be more permissive than use ad bellum and use ad bellum. Okay, so when we get to the 20th century, as I said, Michael Walzer sort of at least on the secular side of the house, uh, reinvigorates discussion about just war thinking. There had always been a, a robust uh, 
discussion of, especially within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but I've sorted uh, the different views sort of into first, second, and then revisionist uh, generations. All the revisionist generations were really on the second generation of revisionists at this point. But, but Walzer, Paul Ramsey, who's a Protestant theologian, James Turner Johnson, who uh, is a religious studies person, the Council of Bishops, they're all first generation uh, trying to come to terms with the legacy of Vietnam. The second generation, Michael Arendt, who's a Canadian. Uh, Michael Gross is an Israeli scholar. And then John Best Elstein uh, are sort of, they agree largely with the first generation. They're expanding the work um, and deepening it in some ways. And then the revisionists, who were centered at Oxford largely, are critical of especially the first generation. So they don't, they don't like Walzer. They take issue with the moral equality of combatants. They also take issue with the idea that war is a collective enterprise. They argue that we should understand war as different cases of individual self-defense. Right? They also deny uh, the separation of use ad bellum and use in bellow. So typically the idea, and this shows up in Henry V, of use ad bellum, the resort to force, that's the responsibility of the political leaders to decide when and whether to go to war. Use in bellum is the responsibility of the soldiers, right? So the soldiers ought not to be held responsible if their political authorities are waging an unjust war, if they are fighting in good faith and following orders and following the rules of, of war, right? The revisionists take issue with this and reject that separation and say each individual soldier, each individual citizen is responsible to think about whether or not their nation is fighting a just war. In other words, whether or not that use ad bellum list has been fulfilled or not. Okay. Okay. Um, so these are just a couple of things to highlight about what's going on right now. So you just gotten a fast, fast overview. I teach an entire elective on this, and that's also too fast. Um, so if you need a moment to catch your breath, that's fine. But these are some of the contemporary uh, issues that we're talking about right now. Uh, number one on the list is moral injury. What is the effect of warfare on those who have to fight it and those who experience it. So both for combatants and non-combatants. Moral injury is not the same as PTSD. It has some overlaps. Um, and moral injury is not just sort of feeling bad about something you did in war. It is actually an injury to your moral capacity, right? Jonathan Shea wrote a book called Achilles in Vietnam where he coins the term. He wrote that book in 1991. So the moral injury is said by some to be the signature wound of the forever wars of, of Afghanistan and Iraq. So there's a lot of discussion about just war thinking and how we could use just war thinking, first of all, to ensure that we're not engaged in unjust wars and also potentially to protect people <clears throat> from moral injury or help them figure out how to process it by engaging the moral realities of uh, there's also a debate I just referenced between Walzer and the uh, revisionists about whether war is an individual activity or a collective activity and whether the, whether the responsibility in war is an individual responsibility, a collective responsibility, or some of both, right? So there's this, this argument about, about agency. The revisionists would argue that collectives cannot have responsibility only individuals have responsibility, All right? So if you want to think about this in, a, in another domain, let's think about um, my favorite business ethics example, Enron, right? Enron did some naughty things. Is it Enron, the company that's responsible for those, or is it the individuals who make up the company, like the CEO, Ken Lay, and so on, right? That's the issue here when it comes to uh, both moral and legal responsibility in war. Um, Lots of issues about accountability. We've seen moves by various international tribunals to move to 
uh, legal actions against Putin for war crimes. I'll, I'll be really interested to see what happens as a result of that um, and whether that is something that would deter other people from waging an unjust war. So we have an accountability issue. What happens if a state decides to wage an unjust war? What can you do about it, right? Both morally and legally speaking. And then the last piece here is, uh, is really a question about um, war is one of those human enterprises uh, where we try to make meaning. So if you think about war literature, whether it's Siegfried Sassoon's poems or the Iliad or Henry V or, um, you know, blogs that were written during Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a whole tradition, obviously, of war literature. Um, and most of that war literature is an attempt to come to terms with war, but especially the moral aspects of war, the ways in which morality really does enter into how people see war and how people experience war, right? Um, and so part of just war thinking is this question about can just war thinking help us understand and, and make meaning, right, in, in that regard? Can it help us sort those things out? One side of that is... Can it help us make meaning when there's been an unjust war, right? Can it help us sort through why a war is unjust? Now, we'd rather do that, I think, before we wage the war and not wage the war in the first place. But is there also a meaning-making process that could happen if an unjust war is waged and now people are experiencing moral injury and we have to come to terms with the legacy of that war? I would submit that Walzer's book, which he writes in the aftermath of um, Vietnam, is an attempt to come to terms with the moral reality of that war and figure out morally what happened, right? And how at least for the United States, Australia, um, and some other parties who were involved uh, in, in Vietnam, like how did we get here? And what should we make of this? Like how should we, how should we feel about this? How should we think about this? Um, so this, and I think this is something that we're seeing with Iraq and Afghanistan, both through the literature uh, of people who have fought there, but also in, in, in thinking about the discourse um, about whether those wars were just in the first place, where they fought justly, did we think about um, use postbellum, right? So one of the issues with the 2003 Iraq intervention, uh, some scholars argue, like uh, Brian Aranda argues, that the Bush administration did not pay uh, enough attention to use postbellum because they thought they wouldn't have to sort it out, right? They thought the regime would fall, be greeted as liberators, and the Iraqis would sort things out, right? So these are all ways in which um, we, want to, we might use just war thinking to help us sort out the moral meaning of, more, of war. Now, I will just say, um, before I open it up to questions, that that meaning-making of war um, has become particularly poignant in the last few weeks. So when the invasion was launched, I was in a hotel room in Cincinnati at a conference and turned on CNN and did some cursing, um, which I'm not proud of, um, but I asked forgiveness, um, about what was, what was going on. The invasion had been um, launched, and I was also transported back um, many, many years to the first Gulf War when I was a college student working the night shift watching Wolf Blitzer on CNN as, as that invasion was, as that war was beginning, right? So I think even as a scholar who studies these things, watching things on TV every day, seeing uh, just horrible, horrible footage, trying to explain this to my teenagers. In fact, when I got to the hotel room, I only turned on CNN because my oldest son, who lives in Washington, had called me and said, are you watching this? Can you explain it to me, mom? And I was like, um, no, actually, I can't. Right. So I think this is also, as scholars, we're trying to make sense of this. We're trying to figure out what does this mean uh, in moral terms, 
Okay, I think I will stop there so that we can have time for hopefully lots of questions and discussion. Invite, invite some, some discussion and questions. Any other questions here in the uh, auditorium? Hi, uh, Jason Little, United States Navy. Um, I, I got a softball for you. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Um, so early in your talk, you talked about the, the point of just war theory is to prevent greater moral and other harms. Since the out onset of Russia's war with Ukraine, the Ukrainian government has repeatedly asked for a no-fly zone, or as her people call it, close the skies. The U.S. response has been a definite refusal for enacting a no-fly zone. The reason is the risk of pulling the U.S. and its allies into a larger conflict. So recognizing that your position does not necessarily reflect the views of the Naval War College, Thank you. in reference to just war theory, is the refusal of establishing a no-fly zone a justified response, considering the potential for greater number of lives lost, which would be a greater harm, or unjustified, considering the reality today of indiscriminate and unjust killings of civilians in Ukraine? Okay, so the question would be, do we think that the no-fly zone in fact would stop that indiscriminate killing, right? Because first of all, if it won't, then it is certainly is in no way going to be worth the risk, right? So the, fir the first question we have to ask is, how likely is it to stop the indiscriminate killing? And then we have to weigh that against the risk of escalation of a wider war, um, since we would almost certainly be putting uh, NATO pilots in a position where they're going to have to attack Russian positions or be in conflict with Russia, uh, which changes the nature of the conflict, right? So um, Based on the evidence that I have seen, I'm not convinced that the no-fly zone, in fact, would do what its proponents say that it would do. And it also seems that there are alternatives, perhaps other sorts of um, kinetic options that don't carry the same risk of escalation, but might have a better outcome in terms of, uh, I don't think we can eliminate the indiscriminate killing. But the question is, could you reduce it, right? So that's my sense. I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I, I, I'm skeptical that a no-fly zone would actually have the effect that its proponents think it would have. Um, and I think that is in part because of the way in which some of the indiscriminate killings are our shells, right, of different kinds of munitions and weapons. But some of it is just like boots on the ground going through uh, a town and rounding up people like old school style. And a no-fly zone is not going to stop that, right? So, um, and I take that question seriously as someone who did their dissertation on Eli and atrocities, right? But I don't think that's the answer. I, are there answers? Sure. But, uh, but I do think that question about the risk of escalation back to the use of VIM piece is an important question, right? But in all of these criteria, we have to think about how would we assess each of these criteria, right? These are, your, especially in the case of use ad bellum, you are speculating about what you think the future is gonna be like. And human beings are notoriously bad and making those kinds of judgments. So I think just war theory also, just war thinking also <laughs> requires a lot of humility about how are we making these judgments, right? And what are we counting as evidence? Because we tend to be really optimistic at the beginning of war. Of course, there's a reasonable chance of success, the American revolutionists would say, of course, no problem, we got it, right? But is, is that a really, uh, the correct judgment. So great question. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions in the house, as they say? Phil, Phil, you go first and then okay. we'll, we'll go through rank. So, so there's a number of questions that pop to mind. Uh, first one is something I, that I don't know much about. So uh, oral injury, um, in the tradition, is it you heal from that, or is a moral injury permanent? The, the one I'm more interested in it has to do with accountability and the 
impact of accountability on ending wars. So I'm thinking of, um, so I've been involved in a number of wars and a couple of times there's been uh, war, war crimes uh, accused of the opponent right. that potentially could hinder the ending of the war. So actually the process itself could incur more injury. Yeah. So what's the thought in terms of the timing of accountability? Okay. I'm thinking of karate and melodic and yeah. the impact it had in Bosnia, but I know yeah. there's other examples. Yeah. And finally, a third question, and you can pick which ones you want to answer, <laughs> is the role of practitioners in the development of just war theory? Has there been? Yeah, that's uh, a great theory? question. Um, uh, on the first, um, I would commend you to Jonathan Shea's work. Um, it's complicated, I will say, right? Whether you can heal from moral injury. In my scholarship, I'm more interested in can you prevent it or mitigate it, right? Because I think it's better to do so um, at the other end. Um, the, the, the second question about accountability, I think, is an interesting one. And the question becomes at what point should you engage in those um, processes? And, and, and should you have trials? Should you have something like a truth and reconciliation kind of commission? Like what, what kinds of processes should you have? That will, and that's all part of the use post bellum discussion about what is going to facilitate um, <clears throat> the restoration of the peace. I don't have any good answers to that, um, but I think that, that that's something that someone like um, Brian Arendt, who does a lot of work on use post bellum, is, is really interested in, he's done some work with regard to Iraq. And so I think, though, but those are very difficult questions about how do you end the war? What kind of accountability, if any, is necessary? And there is this sort of question about whether any of those war crimes trials or any accountability mechanisms would prevent other people from waging unjust wars, right? So the, the question about, you know, keeping people from, Waging unjust wars is, is a difficult one. So um, I really want to address your last one about the, the practitioner thing. Historically, um, just war thinking has been the province of theologians and philosophers and scholars. But one of the points that Michael Walzer makes, and he uses historical case studies uh, in his book is that he wanted to take seriously the experience of those who had fought, the moral experience of those who had fought and didn't want this to be a thought experiment. The revisionists are very fond of these abstract thought experiments like the ticking time bomb and stuff like that. And that just makes walls for crazy. And I'm sympathetic to that position. So I actually think there is an important role, and we do have people in the tradition, especially in the contemporary tradition, um, who are veterans, who are people who have fought. In fact, that second generation of, of revisionists and others, we have a whole generation coming up behind McMahon and Fro, who are vets, who then went back to school got philosophy or theology degrees and now are writing about this stuff out of their experiences, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and, and some of them are, are writing wonderful books. Um, one example, Ian Fishback, uh, really wonderful uh, guy, but he was also suffering from moral injury and, and died recently. So I think it's a sort of a mixed process, but I think there is a really, really important role um, <clears throat> for practitioners, because I haven't been to war, right? I can read about it, but there is something for the, the philosophical conversation in talking to people. I try to talk to people who've been there, right? I try to take in those experiences, but I can, I can only go far, only go so far. And I think that has been a, an issue with just war thinking and sort of applied um, ethics more generally, right? Are you talking to the people who've been there, done that? Um, and can you have a common language? So this then, um, Ian was a whistleblower in, in Iraq around detainee abuse, but because he was trained in just war theory, he could, we could communicate about the issues that he saw. 
right, in a common language. So I think there's value to having a theoretical apparatus, but I think I agree with Walzer that it always has to be informed by the real lived experience. That's also why when I teach this stuff, I'm very fond of using um, war literature because I think the, that brings different voices in as well, right? So great questions, Tim. Okay, thank you, Pauline, for this uh, great talk. My name is Tim Schultz. I'm the Associate Dean of Academics. Uh, this concept of use ad vim or, or looking at something that's not quite war it brings up this question of what, what is war? How do we define it, particularly in the modern era? And also it raises the issue of things like economic sanctions and cyber attack, things that so in a sense, some of them might be very discriminate, very tightly targeted, but typically a san an economic sanction or a cyber attack has, you know, it's a broader weapon. It is indiscriminate. So I, wondered, I was wondering if you could comment on that, uh, those types of efforts to compel or coerce uh, just beneath the threshold of, of war. Yeah, so the question is, should, should USAD VIM actions be subject to a more permissive moral criteria, right? So normally, use and bellow for economic sanctions, we would say they have to be proportional and they have to be discriminant, right? They have to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants or political leaders and, and other people. And they have to be proportional, right? But uh, the, the proponents of the use ad VIM framework say, well, since this is not war, and of course we could have a good conversation about what is war, um, <clears throat> we need a, we, we still ought to have restrictions, but they need to be permissive, more permissive because the harms involved are of a lower uh, threshold, right? Because they're less likely to inflict less harm than, than war, we can be more permissive, which is why they go after last resort, um, and then the risk of escalation. I think risk of escalation is particularly important in the case of cyber questions, right? I think that's probably less so in the, in the discussion of sanctions. There was a long standing uh, discussion since the 1970s about whether or not sanctions ought to be consonant with just war thinking, right? Generally, they're not. Generally, they're not proportionate and not discriminant. Right now, some of the sanctions maybe we're seeing now, where they're sort of more what we call tar targeted sanctions, um, you know, are, are better in that way. But yeah, absolutely. Which is so there's a debate about that, and some people think no, you sh we, we don't even need a new framework, right? We should just stick with the use and bellow criteria from just war theory or just war thinking. But other people say, well, no, we you know we have these activities, whether it's drone strikes economic sanctions, cyber activities, information war, they should be subject to something, but it should be more permissive. Gary, do you have any questions uh, from Zoom? Uh, we do. Uh, are there major differences between the Western and other intellectual traditions when it comes to justification for war, conduct of war, and other considerations in just war thinking? Um, there's less, there's less difference on the use in bellow end. M many societies uh, who have some kind of warrior class have pretty similar kinds of, of, of rules about things, um, especially around the protection of non-combatants, right? But also this equality of combatants, especially in warrior societies is taken really seriously. So where you're going to find more differences it, are, are in the use ad bellum, right? Uh, especially about what counts as just cause, right? So, um, you know, and even if they use the language of justice or something like a language of justice, for example, the, the Chinese are very focused in their just war discourse about the idea of harmony, right? And that that is an important notion for them. Right, and that that's part of that's how we have to think about about just cause. Right, other other communities, especially indigenous communities, might think of the preservation of the community as an important um, just cause, even if the community isn't directly threatened. 
right? So you're going to see some differences on the use ad bellum side, less on the use in bellum. There's actually quite a bit of overlap. Now, whether um, a particular government, so whether Putin is following what we might think of as just war thinking from a Russian perspective is an entirely different question, right? So just because a particular leader does something or justifies something and doesn't follow, that's necessarily consonant with their philosophical tradition or religious traditions around thinking about things. But there's a lot less um, differences than one might think. I think that tends to be overblown. That said, the, the devil's in the details, right? Other questions? Since we have we have like four minutes. Uh, well, uh, another question came in. Um, how do you think that the UN is viewing um, this war and um, and viewing it from the calculus of just war theory? How is the UN viewing it? Yeah, if uh, if just war theory is a calculus of a morally right or wrong war, would you know how this perspective is used at global level organizations like the UN? Yeah, so I think there's an interesting question about to what degree um, global organizations or international law line up with just war thinking. So when it comes to things like the Geneva and Hague Convention, the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, we have, like I said, it's the moral logic for the development of those institutions. I'm, I'm not convinced that we have the same thing, say, with the UN, right? There are so, certain just war principles that the UN holds to, like the idea that the only... Uh, just cause that an individual state can go to war for is defensive. Any other reason has is supposed to be approved by the UN. Uh, the commitment to intervention in the case of genocide, right, is arguably rooted in, in just war thinking. So I think there are certain elements, uh, especially of the, you know, the, the declarations of human rights and those kinds of things, of the documents, the philosophical underpinnings of the UN. Uh, that reflect just war thinking. I'm not sure that the structural aspects of the UN, the way in which the UN functions, um, is is necessarily consonant. Although the just war thinking tended to assume uh, states, some kind of state structure, and tended to assume some kind of state sovereignty. That's under some revision now, but I think m many, you know many just war perspectives start with the assumption that we're dealing with nation states, right? And so there is a, there is somewhat of a tension between that and, and, and say the UN having a more robust ability to um, say, deal with what Vladimir Putin is doing or, or, or what was happening in Bosnia or what was happening in, and we saw the case of Rwanda where there were calls for intervention that were resisted. Right. So I think I think it's sort of a mixed, I think it's a mixed bag there, which does raise, and I'll just say in closing, I think there's a fair question about the legacy of just war thinking. My realist friends, um, who are many, uh, would say, listen, this is all really sweet, Pauline, and you're a really nice person, but this is not the way things work, right? War is about violence and state interest, and, and Putin is, is providing us a really good example of real politique right now. So isn't just war thinking sort of out of date? And I would say, with all due respect to my realist friends, no. And I think that part of the shock of the invasion and now of the pictures that we're seeing, it speaks to something, right? There is a response. There is some kind of sense that something is horribly wrong, is morally wrong, right? And we have to sort of sort through that, right? That said, there are books that, uh, including um, Realist Ethics by a good friend of mine, that argue that, that there's more overlap between realism and just war thinking than we might think. So I'll just sort of leave you with that conundrum. But thank you for your questions. Thank you for coming and dialing in. Thank you very much, Pauline.
Well, that concludes tonight's event. Again, we invite you back on April 5th when I'll talk about what our future robot overlords may have in mind for us. So come back and see us on the 5th. Thank you. Good night.